Cool. I'm not sure how many people are going to come in late since the other ones are still going. I might just start. Um, before we begin, can I get like a show of hands if, if this is I work with DevOps on a regular basis and like this is what's a DevOps, um, where do people sit on that sort of scale? All right, cool. Yeah, hi, hi is it, here is, you, you know, your staff here is, here is what's, what's a DevOps. So most people are, okay, cool. Most people know, know what's a DevOps. That's all right. We've got enough people to do this. Um, so the next... Oh, no, it's all right. It, 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 it's more about how I'm going to run it. The, 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 the next part of the question is um, there's two options for how we can run this. One, I can just go through this case study as a story, basically what's happened in the past year since I joined the company. Or two is... Um, I can make it a bit more interactive and we can actually treat it as a case study and have everyone have a go at actually drawing a, a DevOps decision diagram. Um, put up your hand if you would like to just do it as a story. Put up your hand if you would like to do it as an interactive one. So, okay, most people are leaning towards as a story, which is actually my preference because that means I can go a bit slower. Um, any huge objections to that? Right. Let's let's start then. Um, obligatory slide. Cool. So what you'll hopefully get out of this talk is sort of three things. One is you hear an interesting story about how we went from zero DevOps to something slightly greater than zero. Um, you'll potentially learn something about DevOps dependencies and maybe get some ideas about how to plan um, a DevOps progression or if you join a company with no DevOps, how to get from there to something greater than zero. Um, cool, I'll go nice and slow because I don't need to rush through this to give people time. So the history, this is, this is, this is basically the story. Um, uh, last conference, uh, straight after last conference last year, I joined um, a new company called Focus HQ, or then it was called Project Focus HQ. We've been through a rebranding. Um, the, uh, the company was about five years old. It produces um, uh, SaaS project management software. Um, when I joined, the, the development was completely outsourced to, to a company in Vietnam, um, and they, they hired me to sort of start the insourcing of that software development. Uh, and the other challenge is that we're moving from uh, a startup to a scale-up, so we, we, which means uh, trying to industrialise uh, the, the processes and practices they have in play to take them from startup to scale-up size. Can everyone hear me? Okay, by the way. Yeah, cool. Uh, cool. A bit more background. Uh, some of the strengths of the company at the time that I joined. Um, one was the product had already been validated in the market. Uh, and there were multiple uh, customers who were really strong advocates of the product themselves. Um, always a good thing, so, so we don't have to go through that initial sort of validation of the product. Product's validated, excellent. Um, two is that there was a really positive culture. Uh, a lot of people in the company had sort of, like particularly the execs, get out, all these people from my company that know this story, have been this story, go, shoo. Um, so, um, yeah. People that uh, had got to really high levels of at really massive companies, Accenture, BHP, and said, I've had enough of that. I just want to join a small company and succeed. And as a result, you've got these people that know immense amounts of things, but don't, want to, don't really care about politics and are willing to listen to people from, for their expertise. Um, really fantastic culture and willing to listen. Um, and the third one is that they're willing to invest in development, right? So they, they acknowledge that like, where, they, where, where they've gotten to, um, to move from there to where they want to go is going to require investment. Um, cool. And so that's from the company point of view. So strong, some good strengths there. From a development point of view, they're, they're using Git. They've got some unit tests. They have extensional functional tests. Um, and they have scripts to manage deployment. Uh, weaknesses. From the, the company, um, there's nobody in the company at all has any software development, software product development experience, right? So they've outsourced that core competency, but they also have no one there, not even sort of product management, no one has ever sort of done that before. Um, uh, they have a lot of communication difficulties back to, to Vietnam, 
Um, and so they've developed a process to, to combat that, which is to have incredibly, incredibly prescriptive requirements um, that they then pass over to the Vietnam team uh, and then like without a particularly good iteration loop. Um, so the weaknesses in terms of their, their development process, that's a bit more extensive. So one is that they have a completely unmanageable and divergent branching strategy, right? Um, which I wasn't going to go through because we have time, because I'm telling a story, I'll, I'll quickly walk through. So um, they, uh, they, have, they have a master branch over here that they've diverged from uh, probably about a year ago, a year before I joined. Right? They created this new branch which is live, which is basically their master branch. That's the branch that gets deployed into production. They've got a pre-live branch which is what gets deployed into their pre-production environments. They've got a thing called staging which is a pre-production or a testing environment that they've got a branch that they deploy to. Right? So three separate branches from, for, each in, for each environment, not entirely great there to begin with. Um, the next thing is that they'll create feature branches and then merge from each feature branch into the different branches directly meaning those three branches are completely and utterly divergent, right? Yeah, right, I'm getting some head shaking, like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, the next thing is they have unit tests, but in a separate branch, right? Which means that each time they do development, they will then bring across their development to that unit test branch, create some unit tests on that branch, um, and then uh, and then get them to pass or fail and then move on, right? Um, furthermore, the, that isn't a long-living unit test branch. They keep creating branches for each like release that they do, right? So that's a sort of moving target. Crazy, crazy, right? So unmanageable branching and divergent branching strategy. Testing. There is no continuous integration at all. They run their tests um, uh, about once a month, um, and they don't all pass. They just sort of run it. They'll get a few failures and then move on, right? Um, functional test, really good coverage on the functional tests, about a 30% failure rate, which to me means completely useless, right? You can't do anything with that information. Um, uh, I think it was originally used as an input to then manual testing, right? So things that did fail, they would then do more manual testing, but still not entirely useful. Um, deployments, uh, Snowflake servers, no infrastructure as code. Um, they're running changes directly on production. Uh, each environment Although they have a deployment script, each environment has a completely different script and they change it for each release, or whatever, right? So if there's something different, they'll update the script and then run it, or whatever, right? And so, um, and, and that means that the deployment amounts to pretty much SSHing to prod, doing a git pull, and restarting Apache. Um, no monitoring or alerting. Code was an interesting one. Um, the general code quality and, main, and maintainability um, is, is very, very poor, and they interpreted dry as do repeat yourself as an active principle, right? Like that, that's, as a way to manage, um, as a way to stop proliferation of bugs and as a way to manage um, uh, differentiation between bits of code, copy and paste it everywhere, everywhere, right? Like that, that's their principle, right? And so, we, we, which we're still getting bitten by now, right? So that's sort of the, the, the background. Um, and so, that, so that's what we're up to. And then there's the, the challenges. Um, the first one is to, to handle the transition from outsourced to insourced, right? So uh, there's things there around um, knowledge transfer, so trying to get information, particularly with horrible communication. Um, and the other one is about de-risking things for when we take over, right? Like because there's very poor communication and they're not very um, forthcoming with what we need to know, like it was really about pulling information from them, um, uh, things like infrastructure as code became essential to, to de-risk um, what was happening, right? Like, like we could not know what was on the production environment until we could reproduce it ourselves, right? And so that's sort of one of the challenges we had. Um, uh, there were a few challenges, the uh, commitments requiring premature maturity, right? So um, being a small company uh, with only like 15 people um, in the entire company, um, we had commitments to to things like SOC 2, which is which I'll go through in a, a bit more in a bit more, which is a, a security compliance. Um, uh, um, requirement and as well as like AWS well architected with that which they did as an interim which says hey um, you need to have auto scaling you're going to have a red mark until you have auto scaling right and I know I know massive companies and I've worked for massive companies that don't have auto scaling right and and you've got these these sorts of these things that are saying um, you need to have this level of maturity but really you're at this level of maturity right um, other challenges um, company full of project management. We do project managers. We do project management software, like like waterfall project management. Um, and so that they, they need a plan. For anything for us to do anything, they need a plan, right? 
Um, uh, again, no experience with software development, and in this case, that means that they've got sort of a linear view of what it is to have software development progression, right? They say, ah, you need auto-scaling, do auto-scaling. It's like, well, hold on a sec, it's not quite that simple. There's, there's a quite a few things to get to put into place. Um, monolith architecture, which, again, it's not a weakness, it's just a challenge, because, like, you, you grow a monolith, that's how it sort of happens, um, and multiple production environments, right? Uh, cool. SOC 2 in a bit more detail. So SOC 2 is service uh, and organizational controls um, compliance. It's basically, if, if you know ISO 2701, it's an equivalent to that. Um, uh, it provides a way to demonstrate that you have security practices in place and operate effectively. So it means that on one hand you have to have a set of controls for how you're going to manage security um, uh, that have to meet a certain threshold. Uh, uh, but it's also about like, do you have controls in place and, and are they good enough? Um, so, for example, uh, penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, intrusion detection, security incident analysis um, in terms of security, and change control, uh, minimal admin access, uh, configuration monitoring, uh, segregation of duties between dev and ops, again, not something you really want when you've got a small startup, um, uh, and strict approval and change management process. So, all these things that are required usually for a really mature organization, but when you're a startup trying to move quickly, not, not really ideal. Cool. So, uh, IDEA, which actually uh, is from this last conference uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Micro Herring, I think his name is, um, did a presentation um, uh, about his uh, journey doing this sort of thing, where basically he produced a diagram and sort of uh, he split these things into different areas of DevOps, for example, build, automation, testing, de deployment, end to end testing, etc. Um, and then for each of those areas, sort of planning. Um, a set of tasks of how you would progress through there, right? Um, and here I've added some, some, like, some, some blue to indicate uh, milestones. So uh, this is what was going to happen. I'll, I'll just ask again. This is what I was going to get everyone to do to grab, to get, to jump into groups of, of three or four and have a go at sort of producing like this DevOps progression. Either picking one of these areas or trying to do it holistically. Just again, do people want to do this? No. Good. Let's, let's, let, me, let me just do a time check, because I, I, I can really slow down and let, make people actually hear what I'm saying, which would be great. Um, uh, cool. What time are we? Oh, sorry. Uh, cool. What did you all do? Great. So let's go through what we did. So the first thing was, uh, there, there's a key here, so um, uh, dependencies, uh, things that may have a dependency, but there may be alternatives, tasks, key milestones, completed tasks, completed milestones, low priority, cool. And then there's, there's, there's um, some high priority ones. W was things that needed, go on. You won't be able to read it. No, no, no one will be able to read this yet. I'll zoom in to, 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 to read it. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so, so the little uh, orange, uh, w is things that we needed for well-architected, and well-architected for me, the well-architected audit that we had, so that's, so for people who don't know, AWS will do an audit of your, your AWS infrastructure and say for a certain set of categories, um, are you like red, green, or amber, red, amber, green, or whatever, right? Um, and we use that, because we weren't ready to get SOC 2 compliance, we use that as an interim step with some of our big clients to say, hey, we, we're not there, but we've, we've done some independent audit that says we're okay. Um, and we're going to address that. So we did that, and there was a list of tasks that we went there. Now, the problem with that is that, A, it's, it's AWS well-architected, so they're going to say, what things do you need to be, do to be well-architected well -architected from our point of view? As in, are you using our services effectively, right? And um, uh, at the point that we are, I don't care if we're using their services effectively. I care if we're doing what, what the client needs, right? And that's sort of, so, so showing that to the client may not actually be in our, not in our best interest, but like, um, may not actually be the best result for what we're looking for, right? And there were a few things that came out of it, like the auto-scaling thing, which is, which is like, yeah, that's great, we're just not ready for it and we don't need it, right? Um, so they're listed here as a way to show them that they're there, um, but they weren't necessarily something we were aiming for. Whereas the things that are marked with one and two are things that we need to do, right? And particularly targeted at managing that transition away from the outsourced development company. Right? So, so making sure that we can, so can de-risk the things if they just disappear and, and we can manage all the stuff that, 
the stuff that they'd be doing. And like, it's, it's crazy some of the things that they were doing, right? They log into production. Um, uh, like when, we, when, we, when I first arrived, a few days afterwards, they said, oh, there's a performance issue. Mark, can you debug it? I'm like, I don't know. So I sat down with another developer. We debugged it. Okay, cool. If you add this index to, to, this, to this table, um, it should fix the issue. And so I communicated back to the, 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 the Vietnam team and said, this is what we think you should do. Um, and so they said, cool, done. I'm like, you went through, you wrote a migration, and you, you applied, and they've gone, no, no, we just jumped onto the production server and, and added, the, and, and added the, um, the index, right? And so that, that was sort of rife everywhere, which means that if we were going to manage this when they leave, like, they're all these, like, random stuff that they're doing, like, they, they, they're time zones. Um, every six months, they will, they will manually jump onto the box, run a, run a script to update the time zones of all of their servers. Like, of all, sorry, the time zones of all the data on their servers, right? So in the database, they've got a time zone table. They had to, they, they ran a process to do that manually, right? And so all these things that, like, voodoo that they're doing that we don't know about, that we need to de-risk, right? And that's where the priority one and priority, the priority one uh, items came from. So, hopefully, this is a bit more readable on the right. No. Crack. <laughs> crack. Crack, 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 crack. Wait a second. Um, I, can, I, can, I can, we can work around. Is this any more readable? Um, no, if it's not more readable, can I get everyone to, is it readable at the front? Can I get people to come down who, who can't read it, who want to read it? Come, come down a bit. Oh, wait, oh, wait, come on down. Come on down. I can zoom in more, but then it's hard to see sort of the scope or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, 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 come on. I'll try not to spit too much. Cool. So, so actually, before I before I, before I delve into that, I'll, I'll sort of. Uh, oh yeah, no, I won't. I can't see. I can't see anything on that one. Um, so, uh, along the top, uh, I'll zoom out for a second so you get a more holistic view for a second. Um, so here, like, there's, you can see there's sort of lines along here. Um, this one is sort of uh, automated and unit testing, uh, automated building unit testing, deployment management, end-to-end um, -end testing, uh, monitoring, alerting, and logging, infrastructure management. Uh, then there's things that were in the AWS well architected that couldn't be put there that were just for AWS well architected, and then there's team management. Now I'll zoom back in. So that's that's sort of the holistic context of it. Whoa! Now everyone can see. Yeah, everyone can see that. Yeah. So we started here, so remember, one is the priority one things, right? So we've got this chain here around automated build and, and unit testing. And so built up these things here. First step, automated build and testing framework. Uh, unit tests run automatically. Reduce unit test failures to zero. Uh, test code quality causes build to test. Co -quality, yeah, test and code quality cause build to fail. Um, team priority, prioritizes fixing broken builds. And continuous and then continuous integration, right? So, so that's roughly the the, the steps that, that that I mapped up to get from where we were, which was nothing in that case, to continuous integration. Um, cool. And then there are some other bits along here: uh, code quality, um, reduce code quality errors to zero, test coverage, etc. Right? So then, cool. We've got to continuous integration, right? And there's a priority one chain that I was going along. Um, We've got some things here for deployment management. So deployment management scripts source controlled. Uh, single step deployments to QA environments. Um, we had particular issues around the, the, the database migrations. Uh, we were running an old version of Django, um, and the database migrations would, would routinely get stuck um, and take like half an hour up to half an hour an hour. Um, we, we would always joke that like I'd, you'd, I'd walk into the room and you'd see this screen which says like resolving dependencies or whatever it was. Um, what was the screen? What did it say? There was some screen that was waiting there, and it would be stuck there for half an hour, right? And so um, I had to upgrade the version to get that speed up because it's just not feasible um, to, to have migrations taking that long, particularly like on production. Um, uh, oh, another one was that the um, database migrations can run without pre-populated data, right? So if you want to set up a new environment, um, you had to take like a, a skeleton uh, database as your starting point instead of being able to run migrations from scratch or whatever, right? In fact, we were just saying that when, when we first um, joined, uh, 
you couldn't you couldn't even run at all the app without having a database there, right? And so instead of getting, if you try to run it, instead of getting an error that would say, um, oh, you, I can't connect to the database, it would say, error content type's not found, right? Like, I couldn't find particular data in the database, right? And so uh, I remember when we first started, we were like, like, how can you, like, how can we understand what's happening if you can't see what the problems are? Um, cool, anyway, I digress. Uh, cool. And so then we get to the point where the application and database can be deployed repeatedly to a new environment, right? That was another key milestone for us. So that was the start of uh, the automated testing, uh, automated uh, build and unit testing and deployment management. And then we sort of moved along here um, towards this goal of continuous deployments, which may not actually be a goal, right? Like, like you may not actually want to get to that point. You may still want to have someone in the loop to, to manage the deployment. Um, so here we needed a repository for deployment that repository for deployment artifact management, um, automated deployments to QA triggered from the build, um, same deployment scripts used for all environments, um, build generates uh, um, artifacts for deployments, um, and then eventually you get to the single step deployment for all environments. Uh, feature toggling, code base feature toggling, and, and uh, again, uh, sorry, and then you get to this. The, the, one of the points I wanted to show is that, like, the, the continuous deployments, there's a lot of stuff you need to do. And I, I ask this question in interviews quite a bit, which is sort of like, hey, how far along the, the CI CD um, journey did you get with your company or whatever, right? And people go, oh, yeah, we had CD. CD. I'm like, okay, cool, tell me how you did that, right? And, and you need a lot of stuff. You need sort of like um, this, this you, you need the full CI, um, you need that deployment management, and then you need things like. Uh, 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 rolling canary or blue green deploys you need some level of automatic testing that you're happy with it um, you need you need uh, automatic rollback and that sort of stuff where's my automatic rollback one somewhere um, you, you need zero downtime deploys and that you will see has a whole lot of other stuff that required and now only after you've done all that sort of stuff can you get to continuous deployment right um, and that's why I asked that question because it's sort of like how well do people understand that concept um, Obviously, it's context sensitive. This is for a, for a web app or whatever. If you've got like a standalone service that that's, that can afford to be down, you can sort of bypass a lot of the stuff. Um, cool. Uh, automatic testing. So first step is sort of like you've got a simple smoke test and you've got non-brittle and reliable functional tests. Like for us, we had the problem that they fail 30% of the time. Got to make them reliable. Um, functional testing tests run on build environments. Uh, you need to then you can then use that for performance load testing, benchmarking. Uh, automatic functional testing, automatic performance testing, uh, automatic acceptance testing and pre-live, um, and then, then you get to that continuous deployment, right? So you need, like a, in, in addition to like that CI um, uh, deployment management, you need a lot of testing, you need that automatic testing as well before you can get to the continuous deployment. Um, So that one's if you're going to be doing um, if you're going to be doing BDD business uh, business business um, behavior driven developments where you're you're writing your acceptance tests as you're as you're developing it, um, then you can sort of you can you can create your acceptance tests uh, before you do your developments and then you can have that run automatically on the server. Yeah, is that? Um, again, like like you can see, it's like it's a, it's a long path towards maturity. You don't just you don't just jump there. There's, there's a lot of steps before you get there. Um, uh, cool. So th that was the end-to-end -end testing one. Then we've got monitoring alerting, sort of a simple health check alerting framework, uptime monitoring, deep health check, application alerting, um, engineers on call. I wanted to sort of show you, you need a few steps before you can start saying, hey, engineers are on call. You need some sort of way to manage that. Uh, cool. Infrastructure management, right? So, okay, cool. Firstly, can you manually create uh, a new environment from scratch? Um, do you have separate production and non-production AWS accounts or some, separate, some sort of way of separation? Um, some level of infrastructure is code. And you can see these were number one, priority ones for, for us because um, if we were going to, like, like having, so the, the, the first set of priority ones that we had were back up here, which are around that continuous um, integration. So, so making sure that we could do development and know that we weren't breaking stuff, right? That was the like, priority for me. Um, next one was around this, this infrastructure as code or getting to a point that we could repeatedly bring up new environments and manage the new environments. Um, cool, full, infra full infrastructure as code, manual testing of infrastructure as code, single click QA infrastructure environments, not quite single click, but a few clicks. Um, uh, move production infrastructure to infrastructure as code. So that's a big challenge. Once you've got your infrastructure as code in place, how do you get your production servers 
from, from um, where they are now onto infrastructure as code. Uh, cool single step QA, yeah, so where we are, and single click prod infrastructure environment. And then you sort of progress along that path. Um, and then you've sort of like got containerizable or so reproducible or some sort of containerizable dev environments. Um, in our case, it's we're using Amy's. We're sort of like as a step towards getting um, towards uh, uh, Dockerizing. Um, cool. Then you get uh, uh, automatic, uh, sorry, container image built automatically. Um, allow multiple app servers behind a load balancer. Some sort of way of managing um, stateless sessions, and then you get to high availability. Woohoo! That was uh, that's not even actually so. So high availability, um, and then after high availability, you get to the um, elastic horizontal scaling of application, right? And that was that, that well-architected one that they were talking about, which which for us will probably be red and be red for quite a while, right? Because uh, there's still th this one here allowing for us allowing multiple apps behind a load balancer is still going to take quite a bit of time um, because it's a big monolith. You can't just necessarily run two monoliths behind a load balancer. You've got to, so there there are there are things that they assume that there is only one of them running. Um, uh, and then you can get really fancy. And the grey ones are here are things that we may not want to do, right? Um, uh, able to run exact same application from local to production, orchestrated containerized management, container management, um, run across multiple infrastructure providers. If you want, if you don't want to get stuck in AWS and you can um, multiple ones, and then hey, wow, you've got to the point where you can withstand infrastructure vendor failure, right? Um, great. Don't know if we ever want to get there. Um, if AWS goes down. Um, our, our puny little app is probably the least of the world's concerns. Um, cool, but high availability gets to there, gets to this back here, which is then you can do zero downtime deploys, which is then you can do continuous um, deployment. All right? Uh, cool. Uh, I'll pause. Actually, no, I'm nearly finished. Um, there's a lot of stuff just for security, AWS well architected, um, which I won't delve into deeply. Uh, team management was an interesting one I wanted to put up there as well. Um, starting off with sort of like this uh, request as features. Um, so moving from where we were, which was um, requests as very, very prescriptive implementation details to, hey, let's request as a feature. That's a, that's a step forward. Um, that allows the team to make some low-level decisions instead of being completely disempowered. Um, next is to move to requests as a customer problem to solve. Then you can have the team actively uh, decides how to solve the problem. Then you can define some measurable outcomes for your problems. And then with that, plus some, some statistics, you can actually make some data-driven decisions. Hey, cool. And then you've got two um, hypothesis-driven developments. You can start iterating until your outcomes are met, right? Rather than saying, we're, we're going to build this feature, you can start iterating until you've actually achieved some outcomes. So um, that is not the end of the talk, but that's the end of like what we planned. Any questions or things you wanted me to jump back on? Yeah. When you've got infrastructure as a code, and then you could talk about containerization, why do they differ? Like if you've got infrastructure as your code and you're spinning up dead environments all the time by a code, then why have the overhead for the containerization as so, so the containerization, so, so why have the overhead of having containerization? So, your infrastructure as code, for example, like building up, bringing up EC2 servers, um, S3, all that sort of stuff as code. Um, firstly, you can't do that in a development environment. You can't, like, you, you can run a development, you could probably run development um, AWS, but, but like for fast iteration, you want to run that locally, right? And so that's where containerization comes into play. You can run the exact same things that you've run there um, locally. You can also run it in production. Right? Um, there's a few other benefits, but for us it's still a question, right? Like once we've got to the point where you can bring up, and this is sort of where we're at, well, not, we're not there yet, right? Um, immutable infrastructure is, is a key step to get to, um, where you can bring up, uh, in our case, the first step will probably be like the EC2 instance. Uh, at the moment it's sort of like we, we spin up most of the way there and then we have to do some manual stuff. But when you get to that, there probably isn't a huge difference between um, that and containerization. Um, but, uh, once we start splitting up into smaller services, that's where containerization becomes a bit more into play, right? Like if, you, if you're running lots of smaller services that are auto scaling, then it's a bit easier to manage that with, with uh, Docker and say Kubernetes than like spinning up lots of EC2 instances everywhere or whatever, right? Um, but it's a good question and it's the one that we ask 
constantly um, as to where our destination is, right? And the nice thing about this is that you can change it along the way, right? So when I first did it, and you'll see, I'll go through the progression later, um, this was purely talking about containerization, because when I got there, let's go to that, right? Um, and when we got there, it's like, well, hold on a sec, we can't get there, right? You don't want to containerize this massive monolith. You're not going to be able to deal with it. Um, first step is going to be having that containerization or like the, the achieving the objective of that containerization with um, just the repeatable EC2 instance that's, that's managed, right? And that's, that, that's, that's enough for us for the moment, right? As we start splitting the services, then we might go further. But still not sure. Does that give you... Yeah, yeah, and, pro and possibly not, and, and that's why that's why it's sort of come along with this. And so, I, when we actually start to get there, we may need to rethink this. Um, any other questions on this? Ooh. Yeah, so, so first step is, is find a company that's willing to buy into it, right? Which is when I was looking for a job, this is one of the things, right? So, so um, that was one thing that was very lucky. Um, I produced this as a way to get that buy-in, right? Like this was a way for, for, for particularly in my context, it was um, there is no one else that understands software developments. Um, I need to buy myself enough leeway that I can get runs on the board to say, yeah, I know what I'm doing, and then I can run with autonomy, right? And in this case, producing this plan and saying, hey, look, um, I haven't produced a, a, a Gantt chart, but I produced a, a, a very ordered and very visible plan of what we need to do, um, and, and, uh, and, and I'm going to progress on it. What I didn't have to do, which what I expected that I would have to do, is to try to show the benefit of each of the steps, right? And that's where the main answer to your question is, which is what do we get out of each part? Right? Like, how does that enable us? Right? So, so when, when we get to continuous integration, what are the risks that we're mitigating and what are the speed benefits that we're getting because we've got that? Right? But I was fortunate I didn't need that. Right? Like I, I, sort of, I produced that and, and I had enough buying that said, um, you're going to do industry, like, we're going to invest in this, so I was able to do it. So does that give you some answer? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Well, the, the, the exact same thing potentially, right? Like that, that's one of the nice things of containerization um, is that you can run you can run um, on development the exact same thing, right? If you if you have a good container pipeline, um, you basically like you're you're building it there. It runs like there's, there's no longer the case. Well, not no longer. You drastically reduce the amount of of things you get. Oh, it works in my environment, but it doesn't work in production, right? Because you're running the same thing there, right? And people who know more about containers than me, feel free to yell out and call it when I'm getting it wrong. I presume it is. So, so we, we use containers already. We use it for development, right? Like you can use, you, you get a lot of benefit along many steps of the way, right? So, so one of the things is that uh, to, to get started for a new environment, we had a new starter um, yesterday, and, and he was able to get run this monolith app on his local um, box in a few hours because um, all he needed to do was build the Docker image that had been, or, or like get the Docker image and run it, right? And that, that's one of the nice advantages, right? I've, I've used it previously to manage deployment, right? Like if you need, if you have a, a deployment process, like you're, you're running Terraform with infrastructure as code, you're running Ansible, you're running all these sorts of things, salt, whatever, um, and they all require particular versions and particular dependencies, we had a, a, a Docker image to manage all of those dependencies, whatever, right? So, so that each person would pull down the Docker, cool, I can now deploy, right? Um, and then later you move that Docker image to a deploy server or whatever, right? But it's all, it's all the same. Um, any other questions on that? Cool. So uh, that's what we produced. Let's jump back to here. How much time? Oh, still got some time. So that was walking through this and how it all fits together. Um, progression. So then I wanted to show you like how we did progress through it and, and sort of the changes that happened uh, as we went through it. So again, you're not going to be able to read stuff, but now that I've sort of walked through it, you might remember some of the bits and you can sort of see things. Yeah. So here's where we start. I'm just sort of going to step through it slowly. So that's, that was where we started, like August. 
Um, first change was, hey, that's when I introduced the priorities, that's when we started doing things. You can see, if I go back one, um, what was green here in that corner, I've got actually not, we don't really have that, as I learned a bit more about the context, we don't really have that. But we started to chip away at those high priority ones there. Um, started chipping away here, added some feature toggling, that was pretty good. Uh, changed these around, as I learned actually dependencies changed a bit. Changed them more. Uh, cool, start to chip away at, at that, um, the, the, the deployment management, trying to get the deployment set up. Um, uh, cool, going through December, January, started sort of managing that that's, um, building of Amy's and getting that run so we could actually have reliable Amy's that we could run. Um, moving along with infrastructure as code a bit down there, cool. Uh, jumped, knocked off infrastructure as code, or at least enough for, to achieve what we needed. Um, uh, uh, start to get some monitoring in place so that we could know when the system was going down. Uh, moving along that, that continuous integration, uh, that was separating the production from the non-production um, infrastructure. Uh, oh yeah, we did some penetration testing there as part of the, um, the SOC 2 compliance. Um, yeah, and then the next one is, is soon that we start to move along well, we, June. So then we started to, to focus on the functional tests and get them into play, um, get them running reliably. Uh, and cool, and that's where we are now. Let's go back to here. So that was the progression. Cool, limitations. Um, one is around iteration and, improve, uh, and improvement of progress of certain tasks, right? Like up there, I've shown to the business, Infrastructure as code, tick, we've done it, great, right? But it's not really how it works. You get like a first level of it, and then you like improve it, improve it, and get it better and better, right? And that's not really shown, right? Um, I only put on the diagram things that were discrete tasks to say, yes, we have now done this or whatever, right? Um, so that, that you, that they don't really show that. Um, and anything that doesn't have a definitive goal isn't on there at all, right? Like code tech debt, right? Um, can't really say like tech debt is now at 30% at 40% or whatever, right? You can't really measure that and I can't really sort of say, hey, we're progressing on that. That's a separate thing to sort of view somewhere else. Um, performance, right? Like if the app falls on its ass, again, you can't really show that in there because it's not performance, performance optimization isn't something you do as a, as a step along the way. You sort of, you, it's an ongoing thing. Um, uh, if we decide to split out services along the way, right? Um, that's not something you can really show to say, hey, we're now microservice. You don't really get there. You, you like, particularly with a monolith, you probably uh, get far enough to, to allow you to deliver quicker and, and move along there. Um, quality of testing, great. I can show test coverage. I can't really show that we've got good testing. Um, cool. I did it, and I've got time. And you can see how if I had have thrown that extra 15 minutes worth of doing it, it would have been really rushed. So. Thank you for not making me do that. Um, yes? Uh, what about testing framework? What, what software do you use for that? So, um, so the testing itself, like there were tests in place and we sort of leveraged off that. Um, that was just using PyTest. We're using Python, so there was a lot of stuff there. Um, uh, and the, for the functional test, that was also written in Python using Selenium or whatever. Um, for continuous integration, we used Circle CI. Um, that was great because it allowed us to outsource our, um, our continuous integration, not outsource, um, buy it as a service. Um, uh, yeah, did that answer your... So, oh, so, so we're, we're not there yet, right? Like, so, so, we're not, we're, so we, have, we, we just have some functional tests, and at the moment the, the progression along there is, is to, to get that, that test which does have great coverage and to make them better, right? So I'm working with the tester that we have um, who, who sort of built all that to get him to understand how to write proper Selenium tests, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of brittleness to it, right? There's, there's one that, like, like even though they weren't up to date, they were failing like 30% like of the time for each test, right? Like pass, fail, pass, fail. And that's, that's the most disruptive type of test, right? And so getting him to understand that, that that's really bad and that it's not, I don't care how much coverage you've got, if it doesn't, it doesn't pass 100% of the time, it's valueless to me, right? So that's the biggest thing that we're working on there. Is that, any other questions? Can you make a diagram available after this? Yeah, I'll put this, uh, yeah, I will, there is a link to the diagram up there. Um, yeah. Any other Versus, uh, say, Jenkins managed in cloud. Do you see any big advantages versus one of the 
Um, for, so, so it doesn't matter if it works. That's, that's the main thing. But for me, where, where we were, um, we walked in. They had Jenkins set up, but like again, it was this like like run on a separate branch once a month. Who know? Like like I had no choice in the value. So um, I, I like being as small as we are. I don't want to manage our own infrastructure so much. And so Circle CI, um, I just heard a bit about, and and like and it seemed quite good. Um, the other nice advantage. So so they manage the build. Um, uh, the pipeline, all that sort of stuff. Or, sorry, they manage the, the containers to, to run, uh, and they manage. And, and the nice thing is that you get your your CI as code, right? With Jenkins, um, your CI, the, all the configuration of that is managed in Jenkins, and then you need to um, take that uh, configuration and manage that somewhere else, right? If at all, right? Most places don't. Most places just will jump onto Jenkins, modify the jobs, cool. If you lose your Jenkins server, you're pretty screwed, right? Um, uh, unless you unless you take that off somewhere and you have a way of uh, uh, of infrastructure this coding your Jenkins server, right? Um, whereas Circle CI, you've just got that straight into your code base, right? Like it, it's in your code base, and that's just part of the thing. It's not the cleanest thing in your code base. It's a big massive YAML file, um, but it's in the code base, right? And that, and that's which is great. Jenkins has that common now as well. Okay, cool. Well, you can do it through, through yeah, cool, great. Thank you. Oh yes, yeah. Branching strategy now. Uh, there is a picture of that. Um, we've, we've sort of uh, we're still working out where we want to get to, but like blown away that sort of stuff. We have a we have a master branch which is deployed to production. We have a development branch. Uh, we have feature branches. Right. Pull pull requests into there to get to SOC two. We um we like SOC two has these things like I said separation of. Uh, development from ops, which we don't have, and the way that we get around that is by ensuring that we have a rigorous thing, which is the tests have to pass before you can merge into into master, um, and there has to be code review before you can get into master, right? Um, and because of that, um, I don't need to separate my dev from my ops team because um, there's already peer review is enforced by the there. And that's that's some of the things that we did to make sure because. The, the way to achieve SOC 2, usually if you're as immature as we were, is to set up lots of processes that slow you down. And so I spent a lot of time doing this, we spent a lot of time, to, to, uh, to allow us to still move quickly there. That, yeah. Can I have this question? Um, so what would you do if, if you were at, at this company in the very first month? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would I have done differently? Yeah. Um, uh, because the problem is, it's like when when you work with, with business people and then they don't really know about software development and they just want to have those features out. And they don't really care about these these CI/CD things. What what would you do about that? Um, well, it was interesting. That, like we had that buy-in to begin with, right? There was so maybe not at the start. The first thing I had to fight a bit at the start. There was a lot of sort of like we've got to deliver this stuff, and I'm like, um, I just started here. I can't deliver anything. Like I'm not going to be able to deliver things for a few weeks or whatever. Um, uh, and so um, I, I pushed hard to to get that. And and then once we got past a certain point, like they, they were they were on board with it. Um, uh, so more generally, what would I have done differently with this? I, I think. Um, I think we didn't utilize the, the Vietnam team enough. I think we, we tried a few times to work with them, um, not, not to work with them, but to get information from them, and it just proved like really futile, right? Every time we had a question, we got a partial answer, and we, they were never forthcoming with information that we needed, right? Like some of the voodoo magic they did. And I think trying to push harder on that, because I'm still worried that there are things that they have done that we don't know about, um, that we will never be able to know about, right? Because they're gone, right? Um, and I would have tried to uh, push harder earlier to try to find a way to, to work with them. And although we had the leeway to build up this beautiful thing, the Vietnam team was, was hounded to deliver features, right? They, they bought us the leeway, right? And so um, uh, it would have been hard to, to get, like, ideally we could have found a way to buy a bit of the leeway for them so that they could have helped us. But um, I don't know if that would have worked ultimately. That's what I would have experimented with. To see, but overall, I'm quite happy with what that that, that got us um, in terms of where we are. Like, yeah, think about just the whole thing again. Um, can't, can't. It's like the, the product is, is 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 so validated. Like it is it is at this point, right? So the way they 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 had the option to not like they the business had the option to get more sales on earlier, 
right? Because people wanted to buy it earlier. And they said, no, we are going to get this right with our, with our pilot clients. And once we're happy with it, then we're going to like, release it out to you, to you bigger clients that we won't get a second go with, right? And so when I joined, it's at the point where, where, where these big companies are coming on board. Um, and so the product is like, they love the product, right? They just don't see the, 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 the gory bits underneath. Um, that, that we're facing, whatever. So had to keep it, and have to keep it still, right? And so even though we're up to here in terms of, we're, we're up to, you can see the progression, even though we're up to there in terms of um, our progression, um, there's still a whole mammoth of thing that we need to do with um, technical debt, right? And um, that we can't blow it away either, right? Like we're gonna have to slowly pull it apart piece by piece and rewrite it, which we're doing now, right? We started doing the front end upgrading from um, template based uh, front end to to, uh, to a single page application technology, but yeah. Okay, hand on heart. Who here can sit here and say that they've got a system that's running better than this right now for a large web based app that is actually in production Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. And I realized just now as I got to the end that, that, um, uh, that my, I ended up skewing this well, way towards people who do know. I saw lots of people with their hand, out, hand up about DevOps, knowing DevOps, and so I ended up going, I realized I didn't give any background. Poor Richard at the back. Uh, I didn't give him any background about like, DevOps and what we're doing. Did that make any sense to you, Richard, at all? <laughs> no, sorry. So apologies for that, for, for those who, who don't. But um, for those who have sort of who are going who are going to embark on this DevOps journey or who, who have sort of are through that. I hope you got something out of it. But let me say it's good to know that this group of people really interested yeah. <laughs> Cool. Thank you everyone. Feel free to grab me afterwards if you want to chat or whatever. Um, but thank you very much uh, for, for listening. Um, oh, if people want oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got these lovely index cards. Feel free to pick them up, grab a marker, and run some feedback for the presentation. Thank you very much.